What is the Bible? What is it worth? Basic instructions before leaving earth. Life is full of struggles and it is hard. But we are made in the image of God. Lord, I have to praise you to the moon and back. I don't see anything wrong with that. It's me you help. It's me you kill. It's me you move. It's me you groove. It's me you touch. I love you so much. Oh my Lord, I have to say thank you. Open your eyes. What do you see? Have you inventoried your life lately? Oh yeah, I have something else to say. Welcome to HBS and DWJ. Oh lordy lordy, to God goes the glory. God goes the glory, the glory, glory. All right, all right. Welcome to HBS and DWJ. I am your host, Jerry Joyce. Jerry Joyce. 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 (laughs) Our mission to provide the knowledge that will train sisters and brothers in Christ to spread God's love and create disciples. Our vision to share all resources that would aid in the knowledge necessary for the building of God's kingdom. The adversary does not know what to do with those who possess integrity. We are not human beings on a spiritual journey. On the contrary, we are spiritual beings on a human journey. With that being said, we will open this Holy Bible study session up with prayer, so please join in. O Holy Eternal Father, Son, Holy Spirit, It is once again that we come unto you as humble as we know how, realizing that you are a boundary setter, a caller of order. When people continue to tell us about what we used to do, that should let us know that they are not authorized to speak on where we are in life right now. This really shows how far we have outgrown them. Help us to look at how we are utilizing our time to build our faith, Are we using the zeal from desire, which does not produce results, creating unfinished things and areas in our life? Or are we anchored on the word, which changes everything? We need you for amazing things to happen in our life. Thank you for your continued graces and mercies. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Welcome to HBS and DWJ Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Joyce. Our scripture of the week is 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, King James Version. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. All right. One way in which we display evidence of Saving faith in Jesus is through obedience. However, as believers, we always have a choice whether to obey or disobey. This particular sense of knowledge comes uh, at more than one level. First, it is that of salvation. Behavior is a reflection of belief. Actions, however, in and of themselves are not an infallible test of one's salvation. This is especially true in regards to other people. Only God knows exactly what happens in another person's heart. And we can find this information in 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 7. However, obedience to the commands of Christ is a primary marker, both for others and ourselves which at least confirms our place in Christ. The other, more immediate level of this, knowledge, is in fellowship with God. Even in an existent parent-child relationship, the level of fellowship depends on obedience and communication. A lack of communication does not prove that there is no relationship, but it certainly Uh, But it is certainly not the way things are to be. As we can find this information in 1 John chapter 2 verse 6. A person who has put trusting faith in Christ 
is expected to obey. And we can find this information in 1 John chapter 2, verse 5. But whether or not they do is still up to them. All right, critical to uh, understanding this passage is the connection between knowing and keeping, as seen in the Old Testament. The Jewish people were called to show their belief in God through obedience to the Mosaic law. Even during that time, obedience was the result of faith, not the object of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, 11 offers clear evidence of those godly people throughout the Old Testament who lived by faith, obeyed the Lord, and were recognized for it. Faith was and is essential to knowing the Lord. Here, John places the condition at the end of the sentence. He emphasized knowing Christ as exemplified by obedience. This is in contrast to verses 5 through 10 where the conditions will come first. Our topic today is Japheth's son's discussion. Genesis 10 is sometimes called the table of nations. It describes the generations that followed from Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, along with the nations that come from them and the regions in which they settled after the Tower of Babel. This chapter is a slightly different take on genealogy. Rather than focusing on lineage, this passage defines the boundaries of these uh, different tribes of people. Instead of following a narrow chain of father-son relationships deep into history, this chapter explains a broad network of cousins following a shallow chain of brotherly relationships. The purpose is to establish the various kingdoms which will come into play later in Genesis. The first section lists the sons and descendants of Japheth. Japheth's people apparently settled mostly in the lands to the north of the region that would become the promised land of Israel. While the Old Testament prophets sometimes mentioned them, they will not feature greatly in biblical e events. Thus, less is said of Japheth's successors. They are not cursed in the way that Canaan was, as we can find in Genesis chapter 9, verse 25, nor were they especially blessed in the way Shem's descendants led to Abraham and the eventual Messiah, Jesus Christ, as we can find in Genesis chapter 9, verse 26. However, the names of Japheth's seven sons can be correlated with the names and peoples of specific geographic regions in the ancient world, some of whom would intersect with the people of Israel from time to time. Some of these names would be associated with city-states mentioned later in scripture, such as Magog, found in Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 2, Tarshish found in Genesis chapter 10 verse 4 as well as Psalm chapter or book 72 verse 10, Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 13, and Kittim found in Genesis chapter 10 verse 4 as well as Numbers chapter 24 verse 24 and Daniel chapter 11 verse 30. All right, now the previous verse listed Japheth's seven sons. This verse lists three sons of Japheth's son, Gomer. The descendants of these three sons became three tribes who settled to the north of the promised land. These people appear to be the Sumerians, also known as the Scythians or Scythians. This verse lists the sons of Japheth's son, Javon or Javan. These four sons are apparently connected to the people or peoples who would later become the Greeks. Though Israel would not have many dealings in the Old Testament with the northern peoples who came from Japheth, these names and people do seem to be included in the Bible prophecies. Some of these can be found in Ezekiel chapters 27 and 37 through 39. Culturally, 
The Greeks would become profoundly influential and would even conquer the territories of Israel under Alexander the Great. All the ancient world's nations are described in this passage according to their descent from Noah. Other genealogies in the Bible follow a chain of fathers and sons deep into history. This text is broad, showing the various tribes which came from the major descendants of Noah. The previous verses named the sons and grandsons of Japheth. From Israel's perspective, the tribes and nations that formed these men were located, for the most part, to the far north. Most of, most of these tribes would uh, have little impact on Israel's history until their descendants, the Greeks, conquered Israel's territory under Alexander the Great. It is helpful to remember that this spreading out and having separate languages came after the events surrounding the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. All right, now, until that time, all the people of the earth were concentrated in one region and spoke one language. All right, now, we're going to go ahead and roll over into the next session. Do you have the complexion for the protection? It is now time for our life reflection. According to EvansvilleChurch.com, that's EvansvilleChurch.com, the antediluvian period or the period from the creation of the world to the global flood is demonstrated in the Bible um, in Genesis chapter 1 through 6. All right, now we know that God created the universe in six days and rested on the seventh. He created man and woman in his image on the sixth day. The account by Moses of the period becomes more specific when we are given the names, geography, and actions of the first person in history. God names the man, Adam, and places him in the garden formed by God called Eden which is in the east. Moses provides some more geographical clues to Eden as a garden surrounded by four rivers. The first is the Pishon, which is co connected to the land of Havilah. The second river is Gihon, or J Jihon, which flowed around the whole land of Cush. The third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Therefore, we can deduce a guess to the generation, or I mean, uh, not the general, but, but the general area of Eden, which may have been around modern day Iraq and Iran. Adam was tasked with naming the animals, and then God created the woman from the rib of Adam. She was then given the name Eve by Adam. Adam and Eve were the first generation of humans on the earth. They were exiled from Eden due to their failure to keep God's singular law, which was to refrain from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were deceived by Satan, who took the form of a serpent at the time of the deception, and humanity was removed from the presence of God, their creator. Sin and death entered the world after the sin of the first generation. Adam and Eve migrated east from Eden and had a son named Cain. Eve then gave birth to another son who was named Abel. Due to Adam's sin, he was now forced to difficult labor on the land for food. Adam began cultivating the land and shepherding herds. Cain, Adam's firstborn, was a worker of the ground, and Abel was a keeper of sheep. Therefore, we began to see farming and agricultural practice be established early in the antediluvian period. However, we also see the negative attributes of the world early in this period. Cain, out of jealousy of God's acceptance of Abel's sacrifice, murdered his brother. The world quickly began to be impacted negatively by Adam and Eve's sin in the garden. This theme of the wickedness and violence in the world becomes the crux of the flood story. Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters, as we can find in Genesis chapter 5, verse 4, and they also had another son named Seth. 
Adam and Eve most likely built a community with their many offspring where they cultivated the land and herded sheep. Adam lived from 930 years, which provided the opportunity for a large family of both sons and daughters to populate their family settlement. Each of their children had equal opportunity to also have many sons and daughters as well. Seth, Adam's heir, also had other sons and daughters, and he lived for 912 years. How large was the population? Hmm. Moses included ten generations between Adam and Noah. The first nine are all described as having other sons and daughters while living long lives. Enoch and Lamech are the only two that live less than 895 years. With long lifespans and the opportunity for large amounts of children born to each set of parents, large population settlements could have been built during this time. Cain was then forced to migrate east of the of Eden away from his family after he married one of his sisters and had a son named Enoch. Cain built another settlement and named it Enoch, according to Genesis chapter 4 verse 17. Moses outlines the generations from Cain starting in Genesis chapter 4 verse 17. Moses includes seven generations, while the details are included with Adam's descendants are omitted with Cain's descendants, we can assume that Cain's descendants also lived similar lifespans and had many sons and daughters as well, since they were living near each other and experienced similar environmental conditions. Based on the information provided above or provided previously, we may be able to calculate a larger population on the earth before the flood than previously thought. We can approximate based on genealogies from Genesis um, that the period between creation to the flood was 1,656 years. All right. And during that time, if the growth rate was the same as in 2000 or year 2000, which was 0.012, then there would have been around 750 million people on earth during the antediluvian period. However, due to extremely long lifespans prior to the flood, it is more likely uh, that the growth rate was uh, much higher. All right, now, if the rate was closer to 0 0.013, then the population would have been closer to 4 billion at the flood, or at the time of the flood. How technologically advanced were they, hmm? Can we answer this question? Well, uh, we'll try. Yeah, let's do it. Moses, in uh, his explanation of Cain's genealogy, provided some interesting clues to the technology used during the antediluvian period. In Genesis chapter 4, verse 20, Lamech had two wives. Hmm? Two. One was named Ada, who had a son named Jabel, who is the founder of living in tents and raising cattle. Jabel began the uh, industry of fabricating material from nature to build homes, which may have included utilizing animal skin. Ada had another son who was named Jubal. He created musical instruments like the lyre and pipe. Lamech's other wife, Zilla, had a son named Tubal Cain. He made all instruments of bronze and, and iron. And iron. Iron. I can't even say iron right. Wow. By the eighth generation, the world was able to forge metal tools and other instruments that were uh, that we use today. All right, now the early period of human history may have been far more advanced technologically than we may have previously assumed. For centuries before Noah, the world was able to forge metal tools that would have allowed them to build buildings, ships, farming equipment, weapons, and all sorts of inventions. Another clue that would have allowed the early humans before the flood to advance quite quickly is the ease of communication due to one language or due to a one language world. So everybody was able to communicate with everybody. 
All right, now Moses recorded in Genesis 10 that God confused the human community with multiple languages and then dispersed them from one another. Before the Tower of Babel, people spoke one language which allowed them to work more effectively, efficiently, as well with one another. Currently, we have progressed technologically quite quickly over the past few years. However, how far more advanced would the world be today if everyone thought and spoke in the same language? Hmm. Check this out. 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 All right. If you happen to find yourself wanting to support a minority business, try Akron Honey. That's right. Akron, A-K-R-O-N, honey. Our story, we are Akron honey. You know, it doesn't always take a whole lot to make a change and inspire others. In fact, everyone, everything one needs to make sweeping changes could already be right there. Things may not turn out exactly as imagined, but they could be exactly what was needed to break from the traditions of stereotypes of a craft life teaches us so we believe that when you do things the way that only you know how you have the power to create mind-blowing flavor in your life that you can use with anything just like our honey if you show us a honeybee we can show you an example of how to build something special in your community and how to be line upwards while successfully lifting those around you. We know that life is unpredictable and that every experience is unique. Sometimes because of how we speak, what we look like, where we are from, or who we love. Acknowledging these differences is good. But giving them their space to thrive is ideal. That's what kind of flavor experience we believe in. That's what keeps us buzzing. So just be yourself. All right, I will promise. Making a promise is like shaking someone's hand. It pretty much seals the deal. It's never just been about a jar of honey for us. Besides... Doing the same old thing as everyone else just sucks. It is all about the experience and flavor of things, by any means necessary. Whether it means deciding to never strain or filter out local batches, or taking a risk like buying a second bee yard on the opposite side of town just because there was a small chance that new location could capture a slightly different flavor of honey that was mind-blowingly good. Flavor experience is in our DNA. And we will always work hard to make sure that same experience gives your taste buds a bear hug. And maybe even a flavor smack in the process. It's like a love tap, except with our honey. We're never going to put silly fillers or cheap ingredients in your honey. You can trust you will always get honey of the highest quality from us, as well as new, exciting honey ideas and products we are working hard to develop. Lastly, we understand that as we climb this ladder, we are obligated to lift those around us. Ah, you see that? Hmm... We just shook hands. You can find this business online at AkronHoney.com. That's A-K-R-O-N Honey.com. All right. Hey, bro. What time is it, man? It's now time to answer comments from HBS and DWJ website. All right. Let's start off with Lion Cowley. Lion Cowley says, Thank you for sharing this great review of Genesis chapter 10. 
and reminding the reader of the importance of family and the table of nations. Anybody who wants to have a fair appraisal of the human family will benefit from reading this post. It is interesting to read how the sons of Noah multiplied and had more sons after the flood and that Genesis 10 starts and concludes with the genealogy of the family. All right, hello again, Lion Cowley, as usual. Thank you for your continued support and all of the comments you have made on any of my websites. My aim is to share the things I am learning with everyone who may be interested. It is a great pleasure to learn that you find the call of Abram, the sons of Japheth, Ham, Shem, to be an interesting read. Continued blessings upon you. All right, let's move on to Steve. Steve, Steve says, This study on Genesis 10 from God and Our Lives Every Day offers a profound and engaging analysis of this often overlooked chapter. The author's passion for understanding and sharing the Word of God is evident, creating an immersive experience for, him, for readers. Though providing historical context and thoughtful insights, this study encourages a deeper understanding of the biblical text. Highly recommended for those seeking to delve into the intricacies of Genesis chapter 10. All right, hello Steve. <clears throat> Thanks for taking the time to stop by and comment on this HBS and DWJ podcast episode. I agree with you that it takes passion for understanding and sharing the word of God. Uh, and by the way, this is not for the weak. It takes strength to realize we are not in control and we must depend on God while choosing to accept him in our lives. I'm very thankful that you received this study as an encouraging, deeper understanding of the biblical text. So please stop by again and blessings, my friend. All right, let's move on to Ingrid Robbins. Ingrid Robbins says, Woo, I am getting all of your articles to comment on. It is great. I love it. Summarizing the story block. Ethnologists and anthropologists need this chapter on genealogies, the origins of countries. The lost ten tribes of Israel were not sons of Japheth or Ham. Hmm? Instead, Genesis 10 tells the lineage of Noah's three sons, Japheth, Ham, and Shem. God presents rejected lines first, drops them, and then presents the acceptable line leading to Jesus Christ. Genesis chapter 11 recounts the Tower of Babel and the spread of the nations, whereas Genesis chapter 9 narrates God, Noah, and his sons after the flood. Genesis 10 lists Japheth, Ham, and Shem's descendants. You can feel the passion of the author in this story. It is amazing how the people lived and the way they related to God in their daily lives. God bless you always, Elkie. All right, hello Ingrid. Uh, thank you for stopping by and showing interest in this HBS and DWJ platform. I appreciate you appreciating this episode as great. Thank you so much for your educational and inspirational comments. They add value to the information that is already here. Spiritual growth is what this platform is all about, so feel free to listen to the HBS and DWJ podcast on iHeart, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Blessings to you as well, my friend. All right, let's move on to Rochelle. Rochelle says, Hi there, Jerry. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, understanding, and wisdom regarding incorporating God into our lives every day. Although I was raised as a, in a Christian home, I needed to find out about God on my own. Once I found clarity about the power of God, I was able to develop my own relationship with Him. As I have grown closer to God, it has become evident that God is present in every facet of my life. He guides and protects me through all the trials and tribulations that come my way. Rochelle. All right. Hello, Rochelle. Thank you for your comment on this HBS and DWJ podcast episode. You are most certainly welcome for the sharing of this knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Yes, God is our everything. Blessings, my friend. 
All right, let's move on to Skamalka. Skamalka says, hello, I've been exploring various topics to expand my knowledge, and I stumbled upon your article about the genealogies and origin of dif- different nations in the world. This is a subject that I'm not very familiar with, but it seems to be quite significant in understanding the history of different cultures and societies. I noticed that the article talks about the genealogies of Noah's three sons, Japheth, Ham, and Shem, and how their descendants contributed to the formation of various nations. Let's see. Um, it is fascinating to think about how these genealogies play a role in the interactions between different groups of people throughout history. I'm curious to know more about the significance of these genealogies and how they connect to the broader context of human history. Could you explain why these genealogies are important and how they influence the development of different nations and cultures? Hmm. Thank you. All right. Uh, hello, Skamalka. Thanks again for stopping by the HBS and DWJ website turn podcast. Family lists and genealogies are prominent part of uh, First and Second Chronicles and uh, other Old Testament books. Now, these genealogies genealogies were obviously uh, important to Israel and the Jew uh, uh, to Israel and the Jews kept meticulous records now one reason family history was important to Israel is that it proved one's identity as a Jew a partaker of the blessing of Abraham Isaac and Jacob and part of the people chosen uh, ch- yeah, chosen by God now if a person was not a Jew or Jewish, he could not, he or she could not truly be a Jewish citizen and uh, participate in all of the aspects of Jewish life and culture. Family history was also important due to where one lived. Now, each of the Jewish tribes had received a land inheritance in Israel. So, for a person to inherit land in a particular tribal area required evidence that they were uh, descended from that particular tribe. Now, genealogies were essential to proving whether a Jewish male could serve in the Levitical priesthood. Priests could only be from the tribe of Levi and descendants of Aaron, the brother of Moses. If a man could not prove this connection, he was unable to serve as a priest. A family's history could also show an affiliation with people of significance. Thank you again for your continued support with helping HBS and DWJ spread God's word. And blessings to you always, my friend. All right. But for now, that is what JFF's son's discussion is all about. Now, with that being said, we will close out with prayer. Oh, Holy Eternal. We bow humbly unto you, our one and only true God. Thank you for your love, your continuous graces and mercies. Strengthen us to share the love you share with us. We ask that you allow the information we have received today to produce fruit in our lives tomorrow. Remind us to not make someone a priority who makes us an option. Help us to focus on the important growth in our lives. We ask that you grant us to see the value you have already bestowed abundantly in us and others. We pray these things in the name of the one into whose image you are already transforming us. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. Amen. All right. Thank you all for tuning in. The United States, the Philippines, Saudi Arabia, Canada, Nigeria, the United Kingdom, Hong Kong, the United Arab Emirates, Japan, Singapore, Greece, South Korea, South Africa, Australia, Ghana, France, Malaysia, Malta, Mexico, Nigeria, Spain, Asia, Beijing, Bangladesh, Belgium, Botswana, Brazil, Bulgaria, Colombia, Czechia, Dominican Republic, Finland, Germany, Grenada, Hong Kong, India, Indonesia, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Jamaica, Kenya, Kosovo, Lesotho, Liberia, Netherlands, New Zealand, 
Pakistan, Peru, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Singapore, South Korea, Sri Lanka. Thank you all for your support. HBS and DWJ is eternally grateful. Please stay tuned for other discussions of the show. You can message HBS and DWJ at 704-412-8692. That's 704-412-8692. You can find HBS and DWJ podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Audible, Cashbox, Deezer, Podcast Addict, Podchaser, GSA Vaughn. I would like to thank iHeartRadio for this opportunity. You can find HBS and DWJ podcast most anywhere you receive your podcast. You can also find HBS and DWJ on our website at www.GodAndOurLivesEveryday.com. That's www.GodAndOurLivesEveryday.com. Or just hashtag HBS and DWJ. That's hashtag HBS and DWJ. Don't forget to check out the HBS and DWJ store on GodAndOurLivesEveryday.com. You can also find us on Facebook at HBS and DWJ. All right. Remember to put God first and everything else will follow. Appreciate your steps in life. They are the reason you can look back at where you came from. To God goes the glory, the glory, glory. <laughs>